Hey, thanks for joining us today. Here in our channel, you can catch all of our messages and live services. And our hope is that you would experience the presence of God in a very real and tangible way. That's right. And if you want to make sure that you never miss a message again, all you need to do is hit the subscribe button below this video. Welcome back to especially those who are teachers and school administrators and man, uh, I think we have all the counties back now. I think, are there any counties that still have not started school? That's it? Okay. Well, listen, man, we, we've been praying for you guys and, and uh, I know the students have been super excited about getting back to school. <clears throat> Um, also, real fast, before we jump into the message, I did want to, as you were walking in, you probably noticed the tables that are all set up, and, and what we're doing over the next two weeks is we're doing what we call a dream team fair, and that's simply just, if this is your church, if, this is, if you're even considering this to be like your home church that you plant your roots down, and, I, and if I could just encourage, I, I always, it's always uh, flattering, but yet so unsubstantial when somebody who comes like once every three months and goes, well, you're my pastor. I'm like, no, no, I'm not. But if this is like your home, if this is like where you want to grow your roots, I want to encourage you. God wants to use you to make a difference in other people's lives. And a small part of that, it's not the fulfillment of it, but a small part of that is that you serve even on Sundays. Uh, different areas, whether it's, it's, it's ministering to the children, which uh, I've never met a church, a pastor that said, you know, we have so many kids workers, we don't know what to do with them all. It is always, always, always a need, uh, along with so many other things. You know, at the end of the day, Crossroads, we, we can only go at the speed that people are generous with their money and their time and their talents. So, so listen, I know God wants to keep doing and he wants to do more and more and reach more people. Well, guess what? To reach more people, it requires more people. So uh, just, a, just, a, uh, uh, just want to invite you, if you're not serving on the dream team, uh, man, go, go meet uh, some of the leaders. There's tons of opportunities out there. We'd love to have you on the team. Sound good? All right. Well, now let's jump into our sermon. We, we are in the middle of this series called Seed and Soil. Oh, one more quick thing. I'm sorry. Um, I've had a couple people ask. We did a day of giving for Vineyard USA a couple weeks ago. Um, I, I, people are asking, how, much, where, how, how did we do all that stuff? We're still waiting because you scan that QR code. That's a Vineyard USA uh, giving page. So we're actually still waiting for them to process because they said donations are still coming in. So they're waiting for like two more weeks to report. So as soon as we get that number of, of uh, I do want to, anytime we do like a special offering, I love to report. It doesn't matter what the number is. I want to report that so you guys know what we collectively did as a church. So just did want to let you know, I've been asked that multiple times. Um, but with that said, we are in Week three of this series called Seed and Soil. And if you're just joining us, uh, I want to I bring you up to speed with a quick review of this series. And this whole idea is out of the, the parables that Jesus was speaking on when he talked about the seed and the soil. And he said, the kingdom of God is like the man who spreads seed. And so this idea that God is always planting seeds, that the kingdom is always it's like planting seeds. So whether it's, it's hope or faith or whether it's salvation, it's the kingdom. It's, the, it's uh, uh, all types of things that come when the kingdom of God uh, is present. It says that he's planting these seeds. And he said in these parables, it's, it's, it's ultimately it's our responsibility to tend to the soil. That we don't actually have to go chase the seeds. We don't have to spend time, you know, chasing revival or chasing like spiritual highs or chase any certain thing. We, we just have to simply tend to our soil and make sure that the soil of our soul is in a rich and fertile and distraction-free place. 
And that is true individually and it's true corporately as a church family. And in fact, we pull this out of Matthew chapter 13, verse 23. It says this, he was explaining the parable. He says, the seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. So this is our goal personally and corporately, that, that we don't have a hard heart, we don't have a distracted or a prideful heart, but we have a heart that receives, that is teachable, and produces. A heart, as what we say, said uh, all three weeks, fertile soil equals a heart that is receptive and responsive to God's word. Amen? So that's the premise of this series. So why don't we pray? And then we're going to jump into the word. So Lord, we just thank you so much that we don't have to produce seed. We don't have to make it happen, but that you want to do a great work in and through us. You're inviting us to examine, to test, and then to improve the soil of our hearts, of our collective church heart. So Lord, today we just invite you, Holy Spirit, would you come, would you speak through your word. And Lord, would we open up our heart? Would we push out distractions? Would we, would we invite your presence to speak to us? And would we raise our antenna and have ears to hear this morning? In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, you know, in any group of people, there is a culture. Like, you don't have to make culture happen. It's automatically happening. Any organization, any school, any business, any church, any family, any time that there are two or more gathered, there is a culture that is set. And have you ever noticed that depending, you have different friend groups that have different cultures? Have you ever noticed that? Like, the, like you'll go with the one friend group that's just like, man, they're just like fun all the time. And it actually encourages you to let down your guard and just have unguarded fun, right? And then there's that group of friends, usually the ones that you grew up with or something like that. That's the only reason why you're still friends. And, and they're just like, they're just, they're just complain all the time. Like there, there's no, there's no sunshine that can't be covered by a cloud. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, those type of friends. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, you start, what do you do? Start complaining. You start seeing things through a little bit of a gray lens. You start to see things. And, and, and it really is true that not only are we the producers of our culture, but we are also influenced by the cultures that we insert ourselves into. You know, in my, we've been using this garden analogy. Thank you, Christina, for giving me an easy one. Um, you know, in my garden, the, the environment affects the flavor of the fruit. You know, if you have a bitter environment, you're going to have bitter fruit. If you have a judgmental environment, you're going to have harsh fruit. If you have a forgiving environment, then you're going to have graceful fruit. You know, I learned this a couple of years ago. Um, you know, if you, if you um, study winemaking around the world in different countries and how the different environment, you know, um, there's a reason why you can't just produce good wine in anywhere in the world. Why? Because there's so much about the environment that has to do with producing a really good grape that produces really good wine. In fact, one of the toughest places to grow wine that they're, that they're actually producing wine, I was reading, is Australia. And do you know why it's so tough in Australia? It's because they always have fires. They always have brush fires. So there are years that they have brush fires that it ruins the entire crop. Because they'll say that because of the brush fires, it will make the wine taste like ashtrays. The grape is good. The seed is good. It's a bad environment. And it changes the flavor of the grape. And this is why it's so, so important 
that some, so many people make a decision on church and they make a decision and, uh, on, on, on groups based off of the pastor. And I would say that is important, that, you know, is the, is, is the word being preached and all those things, you know, all those things. But, but there's also something about the culture of the church that will probably influence you more than the pastor ever will. Do you know that? Like, like the people that you're hanging out with in church. And, and listen, this is the, you know, have you, ever, have you ever heard the parent, and you may have been this parent, so please, I'm not judging you, but, but the parent that's like, my kid is off the rails. I can't wait for them to go to a different school so they can find different friends. And what do they do? They go to a different school, and guess what they do? They find the same type of friends that you were trying to escape them from. They're like, we're going to move neighborhoods because my kid needs new friends. And what do they do? They find the same exact troublemakers. Why? Because they're a troublemaker. <laughs> it's not everybody else. But you know, you can go to any church. And could I just encourage you in the most loving way possible? You can go to any church and you can find any culture with any group of people if it's big enough. You can find the uplifting, encouraging people, or you can find the bitter, never found a son they can't cover with a cloud people. You'll find them. The question becomes, are you a victim of the environment or are you an environment setter? Are you changing the environment? Are you a thermostat or are you just a thermometer? See, so what we say, it's the same exact way. Good culture is just as important as good vision. Where you're heading doesn't matter if the ride that you're riding in sucks. And it might not even get you there. You know, and in fact, I would say that um, I've used this analogy before. You know, you could say all day that you're heading to Florida. I'm heading to Florida. That's my vision. Florida, I've been praying about this trip. I got a prophetic word about this trip. I've fasted. But you know, if you get on 95 North, <laughs> it doesn't matter how spiritual you make it. It doesn't matter how many Bible verses you've quoted about it. You're going in the wrong direction. Do you know what I mean? And it's the same exact way with culture. We can say as a church, we're a church that loves people. But if all we ever do is we're focusing on people's wrong, like what they're doing wrong, and if we spend all our time focused on how they're screw-ups and how they're so frustrating, we'll never be a loving church. Or, man, we're a church that wants to represent Jesus, but then we just get caught up in all the worldly arguments, and we just, we just you know, we don't even live for Jesus Monday through Saturday, then we're not going to be a church that represents Jesus well. Do you see that? Like we can say we're going to Florida. We can say we're, we're representing Jesus. But if we don't have a culture that's going in the right direction, you can say it all day. I'll get up here and preach it every single Sunday. It doesn't mean we're going there. Does it make sense? So this is why it's so important to talk about culture. Culture is what prepares the soil to grow God's fruit in our life and in our church. So what we've said, uh, all all. Three weeks so far, and we have one more week next week, is, is uh, here's the four. We're going to do some responsive reading again. Here's the five, I'm sorry, five uh, cultural values of Crossroads. Number one, stewardship. Very good. Generosity. Passion. Honor. And what we're covering today, unity. Unity. The only way to go is together. Do you know that there are over a hundred verses in the New Testament alone that speaks to unity? That there are over a hundred verses either talking about Jesus and the Father being one or Paul's edifications to the church about unity and the importance of unity, Jesus talking to his disciples about the importance of unity, that there's over a hundred verses about unity. So I think to say that it's important is an understatement. That it is such an important facet of the church and God's people. In fact, I think I could argue that if we don't get this one right, the other ones don't matter. 
throughout the New Testament, we see where there, where there is unity, there's always like a powerful move of God. There's, you know, whether it's people being saved by the thousands or people being healed, where we see examples of when there's unity, the church grows exponentially. It always just seems that the kingdom advances are supercharged when there's unity. So today, here's what I know about unity. is I, I would imagine that if I was to do a poll or a survey, that the overwhelming majority of people would say unity is important, right? Would anybody say overblown, unity really is not important, right? I mean, like, and you wouldn't raise your hand now because you know it's a setup. But the reality is, is that I don't have to convince you that unity is important. In fact, I think I'd be wasting my time. I think most of us would agree to that truth. Instead, though, I would like for us to consider if we all agree that this is important, why is it so hard to attain? Like, what are the missing ingredients? In other words, what are the ingredients of unity that creates a culture that gets us moving in the direction that we want to go? See, because what we're, if we're not careful, what we do is when there's friction or where we disagree with something and when it feels something's off, then what we do is instead of looking inward, we just go to a different church. And let me tell you, this is the way it works, is that, is that when you go to a different church, and whether you're new here or whether you, you're watching online and you've left here and you're going to a different church, you, you always enter the honeymoon period once you get into a new church. And man, that pastor, he's saying it in a new way or she's saying it in a new way and it just feels so fresh and it's like, oh, we made the right decision. But then you get involved and you realize that people are people no matter what church you go to. And some of you found that out on your wedding night. <laughs> All right, I'll leave it alone. <laughs> Is that at some point, people are people. But what are the ingredients of unity that we must work for? So today what I'm going to do is we're actually just going to sit in two passages today. And uh, there's, like I said, there's over a hundred. So this was really hard trying to find only two. But I want to I sit in two because I think uh, Paul in, in both of these letters um, give us some really good tangible uh, uh, culture setters when it comes to unity. And I hope it encourages us. So first one is 1 Corinthians 1.10. And he says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony or unity with each other. Let there be how many? No. Hold on a minute. How many divisions? No. But what about that one thing? Can we have that division? What about, hold on. But what about that, real, that knucklehead that really bugs me every time I see them in the lobby? Can there be a division there? Man, well, what if the pastor just, you know, I don't know. I, 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 never mind. That seems self-serving. No, it's just, you know what I mean? Like, like, like he sets a really high standard in this moment of there will be no divisions in the church. That's crazy. I mean, could you imagine being able to walk into a church and you go, no, there are no divisions here. I mean, we, we are all of one mind. You'd be like, you are lying. You got your head in the sand. You, something is wrong. You're like, it's a cult. I knew it. Right? I mean, like, seriously, we, we expect there to be division. We expect there to be dissension. We expect there to be fighting. Like, I know it's there somewhere. Where is it? Where is it? I just got to dig deep enough. Look under the hood long enough. Because like, I, I thought my last church was pretty good, but then I sat in on staff meeting and realized, oh, dang. You know, I grew up in a church where I thought the fam like the, so we would do these business, you know, like the old, the Baptist church business meetings on a Sunday night once a year. I grew up thinking that's where everybody would go to fight. Because that's what would happen. This is where everything that you ever disagree with the church on gets brought up in these business meetings. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We'll have altar call for that later. <laughs> 
So, but he says, no divisions, rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. So I want us to think about these two things. And as I was wrestling with this, because there's a lot of verses, being of one thought, what does that really mean? Well, I think we have to start with purpose, actually. Because if we're of one purpose, then being of one thought is a lot more attainable. So like, for instance, in my illustration, if I say, hey, kids, get in the car, we're going to Florida. And they're like, no, dad, I want to go to Maine. And I'm like, me too, but we're going to Florida this time. We're going to Florida. And if they kick and scream, this is so stupid. I'm not, I hate this. And I just wish I had a different dad. And I'm going to get in a different car that's going north. At what point, dads, at what point do you go, you know what? I'm turning around. And we're going home, you spoiled brats, right? Why? Because when there is not a common purpose, it just greets everything in your soul, doesn't it? And then the people that are trying to move it towards a goal get frustrated because it feels like the other half's fighting against it and wanting to go a different direction. So there has to be this purpose, the same purpose that we all have in mind. And I think it really comes down to this, because there's a lot of things that church could be about. There's a lot of passions and all those things. And in fact, the Bible itself, if you don't even include what the world tells you the church should be about, if you just focus on what the Bible says the church should be about, it's overwhelming. But I would like to bring it down to this. And I think every church, this is the motto, this is the, the, the MO, this is the, the focus of every church, and it's simply Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Most of you should know it. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's the purpose of the church. That's the purpose of God's people, right there. Now, there's a million ways to go about that, but we cannot lose sight that that is the purpose. And if I could encourage you, if you, um, like if you, if you can't grasp that, you will always be frustrated at Crossroads. Because, you know, like after you go to church for a while, it's easy to kind of make it about me. And I, it's, it's like the, I want the songs I like and I want this and I want that. And, and then a younger generation comes up and we're so excited until the church actually starts ministering and they start getting in leadership and they start doing things different than what I've always wanted. See, you can, if we can all agree on the purpose, then we can bend on the how. Does that make sense? In other words, we make majors of the major and we make the minors minor. And we don't make minors the major. And we don't make majors the minor. Does that make sense? This is really, really important. If you want unity, and if you want one thought and one purpose, you always have to look at everything it, that happens. This is in your family. How many times, do, do, I, I, if you've been around for a while, you've heard me say this a million times. So when I was young, before I had kids, I thought, you know, if the kid acts up, you just got to spank him. I mean, just, like, it only takes a couple times, and then it's good, right? And then I have a kid. And then I realize my kid will have no butt if I spank them all every time they deserve it. And then there's this little Bible verse that says, pick, choose your battles wisely, <laughs> right? And then all of a sudden, I have to figure out what are the battles worth fighting? And then what are the battles that I'm just going to let that go? even though it grates my soul. <laughs> you know, church is no different. You, you'll never go to a church where you agree with every single thing. Like, like, honestly, there's no way. Because if you agreed with everything, then I'm actually doing my job wrong as a pastor. My job as pastor should be to challenge, to, to push to grow. Like, that's actually part of my role. My, part of my role is not only in teaching, but to correct and rebuke and then equip you for the work of the ministry. 
And if you don't want to work for the ministry, well, that's, that's your challenge. That's where I'm going to rub you wrong. That's where I will rub you wrong because that is my biblical mandate as pastor. So if you're like, dude, I just want to hang out, man. I'm just here. Like, like, like get off my back. Well, you will always be annoyed with me. Can I just say that? But, I, but if you can understand that that's my purpose, then you can at least put up with it. And you can complain to your wife or your husband when you leave. But you, but, but you know, like when you understand the purpose that this is the biblical mandate, that this is what Joel has. This is not about just building crossroads. This is not about like me getting a bunch of uh, jewels in my crown in heaven or, or whatever cynical people say. This is simply about my biblical mandate as pastor. This is part of what God's called me to be and do. So this is, this is why so many of the conversations that it's so hard for me just to hang out. Do you know what I mean? It's so hard for me just to have a beer and like shoot the breeze. Why? Because in my mind, I'm automatically thinking like, like, dude, I really want to encourage that guy. I really want to challenge him in this area. I really, like, like, I hate, like I can see it. It's like this flashing light going off and I would be such a bad pastor if I don't say something. But it's, it's purpose. See, when that, their purpose is there, then it really helps direct a lot. And it's the same way corporately as a church. So Paul says that unity comes because we have the same purpose and we think about it the same. So this is the purpose of the church. And I would also say if we never agree on the purpose of the church, then we'll never be unified. So it all starts with being unified with purpose. Now, here's where the rubber meets the road though. Even if we're unified in purpose, it means now when we get down to brass tacks, there's a lot of disagreement in how we do it, right? All it takes is five minutes in being in church and doing something in church to realize something rubs me the wrong way. Someone, hopefully it's not me, but it probably is, but, but there's someone, there's something, and why do they do that? It's, it's, if you're going to walk in purpose together, you will have disagreements, you will. That is unavoidable. You will have hurt feelings. Different people coming together, people that are, that are not perfect, coming together, walking together for a, perp- for a unified purpose, guaranteed there will be hurt feelings sometime, at some point. Like, I can't promise you much at Crossroads, but I can promise you if you get involved, you will be hurt. How's that for an advertisement, huh? Hopefully not too bad. (laughs) So then, what does it look like long term to be unified with a group of imperfect people all trying to go the same direction together? And this is where I want to spend the rest of our time in Ephesians 4. In Ephesians 4, we're actually going to look through a, a big chunk of passage here. I think Paul gives us some really good culture pieces That if we tend to, in our heart, corporate unity actually happens. Look what he says, starting in verse 1 of of chapter 4. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. I want you to see the beginning of this passage, what Paul is doing. Paul is actually tying together your calling from God and how you interact with people. That he's actually tying those two together. And I want you to see, he says, he says, to live and to lead a life worthy of your calling. And then he goes into these things. Sometimes we separate those. And because of time and everything else, we don't get to see the whole passage. But I want you to see the whole passage. He's not just saying, hey, you got your feelings hurt. Here's how you do it. He says, no, you have a calling from God on your life. And don't you dare let the devil hijack it by your offense on somebody else. 
He says, because how you interact with people will affect your calling. This is why I always love, we don't, we don't see this very often, but I coach pastors and especially small church plants, like they see this, there's always like the guy that never fits in in a church and they always go to like a new church plant because they think they can show the church planner how to do it. And then as soon as the pastor says no to them, then that church is now the devil's workshop and they've now moved on to somewhere else. And, and they're always trying to find their calling, but they don't get the rest of the verse figured out. And when we, when we don't know how to treat people, when we don't know how to interact with people, if we don't figure out how to be unified, we'll never, ever walk in the fullness of God's calling on our life. We're kind of be these, it's kind of like these spiritual nomads. Because the calling of God and the calling with people are together. They're interlinked, guys. You don't get one without the other, unfortunately. I would love to be called by God to do great works with God without having to deal with people. Can I get an amen? Glory, all the introverts said. You know, of course you don't say it because you're introverted. Hey, hey I, need three, I, need, I need three volunteers really fast, really fast. Just three. One, two, three. Come on. Three. It's, I promise it's not embarrassing. Come on up. Come up on stage real fast. I want to show you a quick little example. If you guys come on stage. I want to show you just a quick little example. I'm going to move this so that the people watching live stream can see it. If, and, and, and the reason that I do this is because me just saying it doesn't stick, but I, I hope shows. All right, so I want you guys to face the crowd and lock arms like this. I want, to see, I want, I want you to see why this is so important. Now, the three of them have their arms locked. Now, if I was to, let's say I'm the devil, and I want to break up this party, see, their arms are actually locked. It would actually be hard for me to break through this. As they move forward together, it's actually pretty, I would try, but I don't want to, Kit's in the middle, and I should ask for three guys so I could just like run into it. But you know, oh no, challenge. No, this is a setup. I cannot do this. It's recorded. <laughs> But you know, like I could run into this and, and, and it would hold because their arms are linked together. Now, the devil knows this. The devil knows that a church united is unbeatable. So what does he do? Kit starts to go, man, I don't think Joe wore deodorant today. She loses her grip a little bit, right? Man, Derek's, Derek's man, if he tells that story one more time, I'm going to lose my mind, Right? I just wish he would shut up. Like, just stop talking so much, right? It's a little bit too close to home. But, you know, like, <laughs> you know, and they're like, man, kid is so judgmental. I can't, man, I, see, this is what's wrong with church, man. Everybody's hypocrites, right? Now, when the devil wants to do something, what does he have? Now, these guys, they're separated, right? So he doesn't have to beat us. He can't beat us. He just has to get us annoyed at one another, he just has to get us to the point where we are offended with one another or we're hurt by one another. Now, all of a sudden, when he wants to walk through, he can just walk through, right? And this is, this is the challenge. This is why people go to church every Sunday and they go, why is nothing changing in my life? Well, there's a few reasons, but this is one big one. Why is the church not making such a difference in the community anymore? Why is, why is America just seeming like it's going to hell? Like, what is going on? Well, I think it's a lot of disunified churches. So then the devil can come in and he can just ha wreak havoc in any way because you've got a bunch of brothers and sisters that are not united. Amen? This is the importance of it. Thank you, guys. So... This is why this is important. He says, you have a calling. And he's called you to do it with people. And if you're going to do it with people, you have to learn how to get over your hurt and be unified. So there's a couple things real fast, a couple principles, and then we're going to, we're going to get into worship. The first thing that you have to understand is that your calling demands that you make every effort for unity is what Paul teaches us in this. That it's not for them. In fact, it's not even for you. But it's for your calling. That you make every effort for unity, Paul tells us. 
And look, he says next in verse 7, he says, However, he has given each of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. So he says, hey guys, I want you to be united. I want you to be, take care of one another. Your calling depends on it. But listen, it, you have to understand unity does not equal conformity. That you're all made different. You're, you're all given special gifts. That your unity is not that you're a bunch of Stepford Christians that all look the same, act the same, think the same, you vote the same, you, 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 like one sounds like the other. No, you've been made unique. You are uniquely in your skin. You are unique in your culture. You are unique in your thought processes. You are unique in the way you were raised. In all of that, in the way God's wired you is a gift and the corporate body needs what you have. So if we don't want conformity, it's this idea that we all have these gifts and in our own unique gifts, we are moving in the same direction. Because we have the same purpose, that means we're all getting on 95 South to go to Florida. But it doesn't mean we all have to think the same at all. Even if we wish we were going to Maine, we still find a way to be grateful that we're going to Florida. <laughs> this is not a real example. I, I feel like I'm really driving it. They're like, man, those kids are brats. No, <laughs> this, is, this is hypothetical. And look, it, and if we continue in verse 14, he says, then... We will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. And as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. And I love this, and I want you to see this. He says, as you devote yourself to these things, as you are of one mind, as there is unity, that you actually mature. Do you know you actually don't mature just by reading your Bible? And you actually don't mature just by coming to church. You mature by going through hard things together, working through hard things. You know, that's why soldiers have such a brotherhood bond is because they're fighting battles together, right? Because he has my back. He's like a brother. My, my, my life is literally in his hands. I can, I can trust him with anything. So there becomes this brotherhood. There's this maturity of relationship because they relied on one another. So it's not about taking a class that makes us mature. It's not about even doing a Bible study. It's about doing life together. It's the beauty of growth groups. But I want you to see something. He said something in here that I think is very important for unity. And, he's, and it, it's this fact that unity allows us to speak truth in love. He said, instead, we will speak truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. And, and, and why is this so important? It's because we, this is important because we know we're fighting the same thing. We're fighting for the same thing. We're not worried about the person twisting it and using it against us. We're not going into protection mode. We're not doing the whole passive aggressive, like, hey, whatever makes you happy thing. Instead, we, we, you know, hey, we're all together. What are you doing? We're on 95. Why are you opening the car door trying to get out? Like, don't do that. You're being dumb right now. You're letting your emotions get the best of you. Why are you trying to bail right now? This is not going to go well for you. I'm speaking the truth because I love you. Not because I'm trying to be right. Not because I'm trying to prove a point. I'm not speaking truth just to be a blowhard to prove to God that I'm not able to be swayed. I'm speaking the truth because I love that person so much. And look what he says. He says, in that speaking truth and love, we will grow in every way. Becoming more and more like Christ. I just, there's this uncomfortable piece of this passage. If you read this whole passage, 
you keep seeing this. All of the spiritual growth is tied to relational maturity. That as you grow relationally, you grow spiritually. And, and, and I, wish, I wish he didn't tie it all together, but he did. And I think he actually says, you know, sometimes fights in church are actually a good thing. Let me say that again, because that's uncomfortable. I think actually fights in church are actually good sometimes. Do you have a family that never fights, never disagrees? I mean, like, like that, that's a sign of something else that's wrong, right? You don't beat those children the way they don't say a peep. Well, they, yeah, we probably want to talk about that, right? The reality is, is when people have passion about a purpose, they're going to disagree sometimes. It's not a bad thing to want to wrestle with some things, to, to, to sharpen one another. Like, like, it's a good thing. So we don't want to create a church that, hey, if there's any disagreement, we're not unified. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying, hey, if there's a disagreement, what he's saying is he's giving, he's giving boundaries of how you do it. He's giving boundaries of like, hey, make sure that this truth that you're speaking is in love or make sure that in your love that you're still speaking truth. That this is part of unity. That unity is not like you just look the other direction because you care for that person so much. Or that you just want to be right so much that you just bulldoze someone with truth without love. That, that there's both that walk together. And as we do that together, that we both actually grow. You know, have you ever known someone that you know you have to confront and it's not going to be easy? And do you know that time leading up to it, all the anxiety and the wrestling and getting counseling you're actually growing. So it's not just them that grow, but you grow as well. As you're praying about it, as you're like, oh God, please let this go well. Please don't let this blow up. Oh God, please. You're growing. So both grow when truth, or truth is spoken in love. But fighting in church about the right thing is actually good. And this is a great segue to get ready to close and that is, if you're involved in church for more than five minutes, something will rub you, someone will rub you the wrong way. And in it, what Paul tells us in this passage is that it's actually the mature that fight for unity. It's the mature that fight for unity. The immature run away. The immature pout and talk bad about the others. But Paul tells us that it's the mature ones that stay put and fight for unity and say, even though that person is driving me crazy, I'm still going to fight for unity. So I'm going to go to them and I'm going to have the uncomfortable conversation because our unity is worth it. God, my calling and their calling is worth it. You know, maybe, maybe, that's why we so, see so many immature Christians in America. It's because they don't actually do the thing that grows them. Instead, they bounce around from church to church as soon as they're offended or there's something that they don't like. So maturity stays low. But maturity, like you actually grow by having the hard conversation. Do you see how that works? Your calling, how you work with people equals your growth. And this is what Paul lays out for the church in Ephesus. But then he says this one line that I think is very, very important to understand. He says, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. And I love that. You know, have you ever thought that he thinks having a few people in the church that rub you the wrong way is his perfect design? You know, that guy that sings too loud or that woman who just gossips or you know, that person that's just so opinionated about everything or the complainer or, or the pastor that makes jokes about your favorite animal. <laughs> maybe, maybe that is God's perfect design. And now just so you know, I know it's God's perfect design because they're in every church. You may not know it in your honeymoon period, but they're there. Trust me. 
But why would that be God's perfect design? It's because those people, if you really go all in with those people, they'll grow you. They'll make you more like Christ. If you avoid them and you run away and you just hang out with people that you like and that like you, you won't grow in the same way. Now, does that mean you're always spending all your time with people that annoy you? Oh, God, no. Please, don't get me wrong. That's not what I'm saying at all. Like, how dare you hang out with people that you like? This is so unchristian. No, that's not what I'm saying. But there has to be this component. And I know I'm preaching to the choir because you're here. But there has to be this component of engaging the ones that kind of just rub us wrong. The, 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 the fight for unity. So how do we do that? Let's revisit verses 1 through 4, and then we'll close. Therefore, I, a prisoner uh, for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Hey, turn to your neighbor and say, you have been called by God. Now listen, that was to the whole church of Ephesus, which he was also rebuking a lot. So this was not like, this was not, he, he goes, I want you to remember you are called, if you are a follower of Jesus, you have been called by God. And you have to start there. Because if you lose sight of your calling, you can lose sight of loving people really fast. But how? Always be, what's that word? Humble and be with each other for each other's faults because of your make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit binding yourselves together with humility, gentleness, patience making allowance, love and peace sounds a lot like something else what would we call that? fruit of the spirit you see how it all intertwines be filled with with the Holy Spirit. As you demonstrate the fruit of the Holy Spirit, it binds you together so that you can fulfill the calling that God has on your life. Because there is a calling, but it all starts with being filled with the Holy Spirit. This is not just about try harder. This is not about, you know, make sure you, you love that annoying person. It all starts with being filled with the Holy Spirit because at some point, at some point, it's not worth it if it's not about the Holy Spirit and our calling. Amen? So Crossroads, let's invite the Holy Spirit when it comes to our relationships with one another. Let us fight for unity because when we're unified, the devil doesn't stand a chance. Amen. Hey, why don't we stand? You know, um, as we go into ministry time and, and then worship, it's funny, like, I always kind of like pray on like, God, how do you want us to close it? Like, like what's that thing that you're saying and that you want people to respond to? And, you know, you go everything from like the cheesy, like, let's everybody link arms to saying a word to somebody. But, but I actually felt like today, for some of us, we actually have some really complicated relationships that are really weighing on us. And I believe the Holy Spirit just wants to visit he wants to fill you. And for some, that may look like encouraging you to go have a conversation with them. For some, it may actually be to forgive. For some, it may be that there's just such a wave of grace and peace that floods over you. And that's what I love about inviting the Holy Spirit is He knows what you need. He knows, even, he knows more than I know, and He knows even more than you know what you need. We just simply make room for him to speak. Amen? So why don't we do that? Holy Spirit, would you come? (sighs) 
would you come and speak to us about our relationships, about our unity, even about some broken relationships in our lives. Holy Spirit, would you come who've come up, I just, Holy Spirit, come right now in Jesus' name. Would you fill them? Just minister right now, Lord. feel like the Lord, I just keep hearing him say, forgive, forgive. Be generous with your forgiveness. Be generous. Even though that hurt so bad, even though it still feels so off, start with forgiveness. So Lord, would you give us the strength to forgive? Give us the courage to forgive to those who feels like they don't deserve it. Church United is unbeatable. So would you do that in our lives? Just sew up some of those relationships, Lord. It's so hard to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, too. Lord, give us the grace to do that. In Jesus' name.